Okay, today's message is going to be answering Christmas criticisms. Okay, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of brethren that have a really big problem with celebrating the day of Christmas. Uh, they they connect it to all kinds of paganism and witchcraft and human sacrifice and all sorts of things that I've heard. I'm very familiar with the attacks. I've studied the attacks for a little while. I wasn't sure which way to go. And I really prayed and asked the Lord to show me the truth on it. Now, if you're listening this morning and you're saying, oh, he's going to be speaking in defense of Christmas, I'm not going to listen. Well, I want to remind you of Proverbs 18:13, which says, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Please listen to this message this morning with an open mind. Uh, remember that I am saved. I'm a Bible-believing pastor of this little church here, this little fellowship, Bible Believers Fellowship. I'm not an apostate. Okay, don't start calling me all kinds of names and write this ministry off because you disagree with me. Uh, the subject of Christmas is not a major doctrinal stand. And we're going to see that as we go through this study this morning. And a lot of the brethren turn it into this huge big thing. If a man or a woman celebrates Christmas, they're not right with God, you know, and all this other stuff. And unfortunately, there are some pagan things associated with this time of the year that I would say you don't want to have any part of. Uh, you say like what? Well, Santa Claus. Santa Claus, you're, uh, you are fixing characteristics of deity to a man. He can see you. He knows if you've been good or bad. He travels all over the world in one night. That's supernatural power. And, and I don't agree with Santa Claus. I think that you need to scrap that tradition of this, this man that has characteristics of God. That's very dangerous. But there are other aspects of the Christmas holiday that are not bad. Okay, and unfortunately, a lot of the brethren in their research and in their attacks on the Christmas holiday are actually lying. You know, that's something I've learned as a researcher. There have been many times when I'm convinced that something is bad, a new version or, or some apostate preacher out there, and I'm convinced that he's bad, and I look for evidence against this thing I'm trying to rebuke, and the evidence just isn't strong enough. And as a researcher, I can't use it if it's not strong enough, if it's not there. I have to be honest. And there has been a couple times that I've put things out and somebody comes along and they say, Brian, I know you meant well, but here's the actual facts. You need to look at this. And I'll look at their evidence and I say, oh boy, yeah, that proves me wrong. And I have to admit to being wrong. Okay, and that's what you need to do this morning. You need to look at the evidence that I'm going to be presenting here. And if you're wrong, you better change. Even if you are against Christmas and whatever else, you need to look at the facts. And unfortunately, a lot of the anti-Christmas Christians are not telling you the truth. They are lying to you. And I'm going to look at the two biggest things that they'll use. And what they do is they use these two big things and then they'll throw in a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, guilt by association. And in the end, you end up saying, well, all this massive amount of evidence... But it all goes back to these first two principles. You say, what are those two principles? First of all, the definition of the word Christmas. We're going to look at that. And then also Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. The thing about going out into the forest and cutting a tree and bringing it in, fastening it, fastening it with nails and decking it with gold and silver. And people say, well, see, Christmas is condemned in Scripture. Uh, you're going to have to hold on there and listen to the actual evidence today. Now, let's start out here with the definition of the word Christmas. Now, if you get into this study, what you're going to be told is that Christmas is two words put together, Christ and Mass. And you see, Mass is the Roman Catholic practice of transubstantiation, the Eucharist. So, which is what? That's the sacrifice of Christ. So then, Christ Mass would be the sacrifice of Christ. So when you say Mary, Christ Mass, you're saying Mary, the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. And they go, oh, that looks bad. And it would look bad if that was true. But unfortunately, it's not true. Or fortunately, it's not true. <laughs> you say, well then, that what, how do you define the word Christmas? Well, when I want to define a word, I look it up in a dictionary. 
I know that might be new to some people. You know, it's a lot easier just to make up your own definition. But <clears throat> we're actually going to look here in the dictionary. And what dictionary? Well, one of the standards for Bible-believing Christians is the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Because a lot of times he'll include scripture references in the definition of words. All right, the word Christmas, it's a noun. And it says here in, in kind of the brackets, Christ and Mass. Saxon, M-A-E-S-S-A. -S -S -A. I'm not sure exactly how you'd pronounce that. But it says here, a holy day or feast. That's what the Saxon word Mass means. Hmm. And it has a D and an K-E-R-S-M-I-S. I guess another language spelled it Christmas as Christmas there. But I'll give you the definitions here quick. Number one has two definitions. Number one, the festival of the Christian church observed annually on the 25th day of December in memory of the birth of Christ and celebrated by a particular church service. The festival includes 12 days. Definition number two, Christmas Day. Now, did you see anything in there about the Catholic Church? No. I didn't see anything in there about that. And you say, well, it's the Mass of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. That's a lie. The dictionary does not define it that way. The Saxon word Mass, which is where that, that word comes from, that Saxon word means a holy day or feast. So you want the true dictionary definition, you have a holy day of Christ. That's what the commemoration is all about. It has nothing to do with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, I don't know, I still believe it. Okay, let me ask you a question. Where is the Catholic Church teachings in the celebration of Christmas? The traditional celebration of the day of Christmas. Where is the sacrifice of Christ at in that, you know, if it is the, if that's what the word Christmas means, where's it at? Where do you have drinking of wine and breaking of bread by a priest in the traditional celebration of Christmas? I mean, does the, does the family get up in the morning and the father comes and he says, okay, kids, drink the wine. This is the blood. Here's the bread. That's the body. You know, and he does his little in hoc signo vinces or, you know, it's some kind of stupid Latin or something like that. That's not there. It has nothing to do with the Christmas holiday. Nothing at all. It's a celebration of the birth of Christ. Okay, you say, well, it's not the birth of Christ. December 25th is when he wasn't born. You know, he wasn't born then. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But let's just assume for a minute that Christmas is to remember the sacrifice of Christ. It's a yearly remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. Well, let's just say that for a second. Aren't we supposed, aren't we supposed to remember his sacrifice? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 says, for I have received of the Lord that which I which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is in, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Hmm. Verse 25, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now we typically call that communion, a communion service where we, we, where we remember and honor the death of Jesus Christ. We remember how he died. Now that doesn't save you, you know, like the Catholics teach, that drinking the, the wine and eating the bread, you know, that doesn't save you, but... The point is, it's it's done in remembrance. So even if Christ, you know, this this Christ Mass thing, even if that was, you know, it's 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 celebrating the death of Christ. Well, in a sense, we're supposed to do that. So even if it were true that Christ, Christmas means the Mass of Christ, as in the sacrifice of Christ, you still have a very weak argument there to say that it's a pagan satanic day. It, it's just incredibly weak, and you know. The problem, one of the big issues here is that when you take a really strong stand against Christmas, you you can actually be proved very easily that you're a hypocrite by the lost world. And I'm going to show you that today, how, how that thing happens. 
Uh, and by the way, you know, if you talk to a lot of the lost world out there and you talk to them about Christmas and you say, you know, uh, the thing that, and they say about Jesus being born, you can then follow it up with, well, why was he born? And there's a lot of lost people that have the knowledge and they have the understanding there that they'll say, well, he was born so that he could eventually die on the cross to pay for people's sins. I've heard lost people say that. You know, they don't believe it. They haven't come to a place of repentance. But the point is, the lost world, they know what it's about. It's a remembrance. They can remember that it was Jesus was born to die on the cross to take away the sins of the world. And it's interesting, too, by the way, something else I want to say here quick. A lot of the lost world now, atheists in particular, they're trying to take the word Christ out of Christmas. You know, and remember the, dic the dictionary definition is a holy day of Christ or a festival of Christ. It doesn't mean the sacrifice of Christ. That's a lie. Don't believe that. But the lost worlds come along and they don't say Christmas. They say Xmas. And I've actually heard some of these anti-Christmas Christians saying, I refuse to say Christmas. I'll say Xmas. Do you realize you're joining with the atheists? You know? Let's join hands with the atheists and condemning Christmas. We'll say Xmas. Uh, I think the Lord's probably got a few problems with that. I mean, you know, you get these atheists going around attacking nativity scenes and saying we want to get rid of them. I guess Bible-believing Christians should join hands with them. Sorry, but I, I just I think that's really stupid. It's a really, really bad idea. Now we're going to look at the other big objection to Christmas. Okay, we're actually going to turn in our Bibles here now. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. This is the big one. You know, they say, oh, see, the Bible condemns Christmas. It condemns the Christmas tree. Well, we're going to see about that. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. It says here, hear, the, hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Hmm. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. They say, see, God hates the sacrifice, you know, this, the Christmas tree and the Christmas holiday. Rah, rah, rah. That's what they say. But let's just look at it. Let's dissect these verses here. Okay, question number one. Who is the Lord writing to? Israel. Israel. You see it there in verse one. O house of Israel. That's very important. God is writing to the Jewish people. And I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of Christians which have this, this replacement theology thing in their head, even though a lot of them won't, they won't admit it. They have this idea that the church is back here in the Old Testament. Now, I'll grant you, there are some verses that you can use for instruction in righteousness. You know, absolutely. But you've got to be real careful about going back to verses that are specifically to Israel and trying to apply them to today. I'll give you a good example. Second uh, Chronicles 7.14, I think it is. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and you know, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, probably that messed up. I'm just quoting from memory here. I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and cleanse their land. Whatever the verse is, I probably butchered that. But the point is, they'll say, you know, they'll quote that, like America has a chance or something. Uh, that was for Israel. Old Testament Israel. That's not for us today. And by the way, if you want to use that verse, you say, well, but I think it applies to today. Go back into your Old Testament and read how they would cleanse the land. They'd go in there and they'd kill. Old Testament Israel was a governmental system. God used them, and they went in, and they had military power. And God would say, there's sodomites in the land, go in there and kill them all. There's worshipers of Baal in the land, go in there and kill them all. You aren't going to find that in the New Testament. So how could you apply Second Chronicles 7.14 to the church today? It's not going to happen. God's not going to heal America 
with the Sodomites running around. It isn't going to happen. God would say, go on there, in there and just wipe them out. But that's not a New Testament teaching. So why would you try to lie to people and take Second Chronicles seven fourteen and apply it to today? See, it doesn't work. And right here in this in this passage, Jeremiah ten verses one through five, God is speaking to Israel. He's speaking to the Jewish people. Now look at uh, chapter uh, verse two. Thus saith the Lord: Not learn not the way of the heathen. Who are the heathen? They're Gentiles. Our ancestors, most of the people listening to this message. Most of you are, are from Europe, or maybe there's some, some you know black brothers or sisters that are from Africa, or maybe some people from the Orient. We're Gentiles. Okay, we're not Jewish people. We are the heathen. And you say, oh, that's horrible. We're heathen. The word heathen doesn't necessarily mean pagan. It doesn't mean that you're a wicked, horrible, human-sacrificing sex pervert or something. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that we were without, were, you know, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, as it says there in the New Testament. Being heathen is not necessarily a bad thing. We were all heathen at one point in time. Doesn't mean that we were all evil or witches or something. It just means we were heathen. Okay, got to watch out for that stuff. Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 30. I'll read that real quick here. And here Paul is speaking to heathen people. It says here, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Okay, they were trying to worship God, but they didn't know how. And Paul said, You're ignorantly worshiping him. You know him. He didn't say, "You wicked pagans, you horrible, evil people." He, they were trying to find God. They really were. Acts seventeen verse twenty four, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now isn't that interesting? Paul said, some of your own poets, some of the heathen poets back there actually had some understanding of who God was. They had this belief in an unknown God. They didn't know him yet. Okay, why? Well, they were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, as I said. And this heathen practice, we're going to see this in just a minute here, this heathen practice of this thing of Yule, especially, it was a teaching that there was a this God it was a prophecy, actually, that there was a God that would die, and within three days, he would be resurrected and glorified. That's what the Christmas tree celebration is all about. Okay, You, you study the, the thing of Yule, they would take a log, and they would burn it for three days, and on the third day, it would rise again as the Christmas tree, and it would be celebrated, it would be glorified. Okay, now, no pagan deity ever was able to fulfill that prophecy. So what was it? Well, I, I believe it was actually their way, our heathen ancestors, if you're a, a Gentile Christian, our heathen ancestors had a way that they were trying to find God. Okay, that's what's going on here in Acts chapter 17. Paul's not rebuking them, slamming, you bunch of wicked heathen pagan human sacrifice and he wasn't doing that he was saying hey you guys are trying to figure out who god is i'm here to declare him unto you see paul used and he even read i mean obviously there he said about whom your own uh as certain also of your own poets have said well how did how did paul know that unless he read what they were saying see you know paul was actually using their heathen system to lead them to jesus christ Hmm. Isn't that something? 
But let's continue on here. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 29 and 30, and then we're done there in the book of Acts. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Okay, don't make any images of God. Uh, verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repent, there is the word, by the way, not just believe. <laughs> okay, so God winked at the times of that ignorance. He understood the fact that these are heathen people. Now, all men everywhere are commanded to repent now. So, I believe that you can use something that is a custom of the people to lead people to a repentant state, belief in Jesus Christ. And this is a, a phenomenal time of the year to talk to people. The average person is completely innocent. Christmas is a time when they get together with family, when they do nice things for other people. And they and a lot of the lost people out there, they love the, the songs, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. They love the songs like Joy to the World, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. A lot of lost people love those songs. And you can use that, the times of that ignorance, you can use it to lead them to Jesus Christ. And there have been many Christians that have been saved at this time of the year. And it just totally, just totally cut it off and I'll have nothing to do with it. You are falling into a position where you're going to be proved as a hypocrite. And I'm going to show you that as we continue here. And please continue listening. Please be open-minded about this. All right, I went through this thing. You know, I understand. You know, a lot of the brethren out there, they want to serve the Lord. They want to get rid of everything that's wrong out of their life. But you got to be careful with this whole conspiracy thing, with all the studying the occult and all that other stuff, because a lot of it, you know, Christians can actually lie to you about it. And they can actually lead you astray. But we'll continue here. Uh, the third question I want to ask here in, about uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Are these customs that these people have, are they sin? Okay, look at uh, verse 3. For the customs of the people are sin. Is that what it says? No, it says they're vain. Vain. In other words, it's you know not really good, not really bad. It's just kind of vain. You know, all the work that goes into Christmas time, putting the tree up, decorating the tree, getting the presents, wrapping the presents, baking the cookies, all the stuff that the average person, the average family does for Christmas, it's kind of vain. It takes time. Okay? But is it a sin? See, these guys, I've, I've heard the, the preachers, you know, and they, it's a wicked abomination in the sight of God. You know, they'll yell about this thing. Please show me that from the scripture. It doesn't say that. The only condemnation at all of this practice here is it says the customs of the people are vain. It never calls it a sin. There's a lot of things that you'll do in life that are vain, but they're not a sin. And then it goes on here to say about cutteth the tree of the forest, work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, and they deck it with silver and with gold, fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. And of course, that's the practice that's done. Uh, but it's interesting, verse 5 there, if you see that, it says, They are upright as the palm tree. If you study the ancient Babylonian practice, the celebration of Tammuz, the December 25th thing, the original quote-unquote Christmas tree was actually a palm tree. It was not a fir tree. That's the Norse people, the Druidic people of Northern Ireland. They were the ones that had the fir tree. And then they brought in the mistletoe and a lot of those other things. And you say, well, it's, it's, it was a horrible pagan. No, 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 no. You're going to have a hard time proving that. Okay, heathen, yes. But as I said, just being heathen doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. Okay, it just means that you're without Christ. You're a stranger to the commonwealth of Israel. Now, just another point here I want to make quickly as we continue is that if you're a missionary and you go into a foreign country, one of the things that you'll be taught if you're being sent out by a good mission field, a, a good ministry, one of the things that they will teach you is when you go to a foreign people, you are there to bring them Jesus Christ. You are not there to attack their customs and their traditions. 
Now, obviously, if they're if they're eating people or something, if they're cannibals, well, you might want to get around to tell them that's not a good idea. But you don't go in there and change their customs and their traditions, because to a lot of people, those customs are very sacred. And now, as Christians here in America and and over in Europe and wherever else. You have to be careful about attacking people's customs because most of the people are very innocent in those customs. And it's a very sacred thing to them to say, my my parents did it and my grandparents. I remember going to my grandparents' house for Christmas. I remember, you know, I even met my great-grandmother the one time. And, you know, it's a very sacred thing. And you come in there and, Christmas is all the devil. It's sex orgies and and it's human sacrifice. They're going to look at you like you're nuts. The average person isn't doing the things that a lot of these Christians are coming out and claiming Christmas is about. It's a lie. It's a total lie. Okay, most, I mean, the truth is most people enjoy Christmas because it's a time for family and giving gifts to others. Well, that's something we ought to stop, right? Giving gifts, you know, that's that's a horrible thing. And, you know, a lot of people, they'll say Christmas is wrong and birthdays are wrong as well. You know, and it, well, because it has, it's not a, a Bible origin. Well, that doesn't necessarily make it bad. There's a lot of things that are not, don't have their origin with the Jewish people, and they're not bad. Okay, don't, don't fall for this stuff. I mean, unless you're a cheapskate and you want to get out of buying gifts for your kids for Christmas and for their birthday. All right, uh, another thing here. Were the Jews to fear the Christmas tree? No, the Bible says that the tree cannot do good or cannot do evil or good. Look at verse 5. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. You're not going to wake up in the middle of the night and have a Christmas tree leaning over you ready to kill you or something. (laughs) They're not good or bad. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good says it right there. Oh, the Christmas tree is wicked, it's evil. You can't prove that from Scripture. The Bible says they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Why? It's an inanimate object. It has no life of its own. To some people, they might look at the Christmas tree and say it's a a phallic symbol and a horrible thing, and and they might have some really weird beliefs attached to it. But to other people, it's a special symbol of the Christmas holiday. It's a time when they, they remember. I remember you know being little and I saw the Christmas tree and all the lights and how pretty it was and all that. There's no evil intent in them. And just to kind of illustrate that point, I have here on the table, this is one of the news media's most feared things. This is a semi-automatic Glock pistol. There have been multiple shootings done with these handguns. Okay, the Virginia Tech shooter used a Glock. This guy here, this nut, this crazy nut that went and killed a judge and that congresswoman or whatever injured her really bad. He used a Glock, I think Model 19. This is a Glock Model 36 right here. Here's the magazine, and you can see it's fully loaded. Okay, now I just chambered around. Now I'm going to set that Glock right here on the... Uh, on this table here and we're going to see how long it takes for that Glock to get up and start shooting people okay we'll just wait here for a minute hmm it just seems to be sitting there it's not doing anything hey but the news media said it's bad they said killings have happened a lot by these Glock pistols another shooting happened and they'll show an image of a Glock pistol So they're obviously bad because the news media said that they're bad. So we're just going to sit here. Any second, that thing's going to jump up and start killing people. You say, well, come on, Brian, you're being ridiculous. Yeah, it's about as ridiculous as saying the Christmas tree is evil. No, you see, it's evil because of the person that picks it up. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. But it depends on the person, the individual, what you're going to do with it. I take that pistol out and I shoot targets with it. Okay, that's the purpose I have it. If somebody tries to come and hurt myself or my friends or my family, well, yeah, I'll have to use it on them. Okay, it is a defensive handgun. And it was designed for that, by the way. Okay, it wasn't designed as a target handgun, you know. But the fact is, 
I'm not going to go do anything bad with it because, you see, I'm not a bad person. I'm not going to go murder people with that gun. It's an inanimate object. Now, if some bad guy walks in here that's a serial killer or something, well, sure, he'll pick it up and he'll kill people. You see the point I'm trying to make here? A Christmas tree to some people, and I know some really good Christian people that celebrate Christmas. And see, to them, it's a time about family togetherness. It's a time about getting gifts for people, and, and it's a time of love and, and fellowship. It's not a bad thing. The Christmas tree is an inanimate object. It's used for good in, the, in good Christian families. But for some people, maybe there's witches out there that, to them, the Christmas tree is this ancient pagan festival thing, and they do weird things. Okay, fine. But that doesn't make, make the Christmas tree bad. Any more than that Glock laying right there, that's not a bad thing. Okay? and But yet there's a lot of people out there that have been brainwashed that just because I have that pistol, they think I'm bad. Just like a lot of the Christians out there that think just because you have a Christmas tree, then that makes you bad. It's a dumb argument, I'll tell you what. One other little thing here, quick. What about this? And you say, well, I can't see it. Well, yeah, you're listening on the sermon here. I have a dollar bill in my hands. If you say, oh, I'll have nothing pagan in my home, how about in your wallet? Here you have a dollar bill, and on the back, there's a symbol, the pyramid with the all-seeing eye above it, annuit shapedus novus ordo seclorum, which means in Latin, announcing the conception or birth of a new order that's secular, a new order without God. So you want to talk about saying, you know, Christmas, the death of Christ, you know, like they say. How about something saying, announcing the birth of a new order, a new world without God? And yet you carry these around. You say, what's your point? My point is, brethren, you live in a lost world, a fallen world. And if you want to ban everything that's pagan or has pagan type influences, you're not going to have a whole lot. <laughs> See? See, you, you get into hypocrisy after a while. You see, as a Christian, if you're out there in the world and you're taking a stand against Christmas, somebody can come up and they say, well, do you take a stand against these dollar bills? Do you refuse them when you're given change? You say, no, I'll take four quarters instead. You know, <laughs> what do you do? I refuse to have anything to do with paganism. Do you sell or do you use the names of the week that are named after Norse gods? Sunday, Moon Day, Tyre's Day, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, Frigg's Day, Saturn Day. They're named after Norse gods. Are you going to come up with new names of the days of the week? The months of our year are pagan. Okay, I'm not going to get into all that. There's a lot of things that are of heathen pagan origin. Do you really want to start down that road where you ban everything? Well, you might as well go dig a hole out in the woods or something and go live in it. You know, that's about all you're going to be able to do to avoid any connection with anything pagan. All right, continuing on here. And one other thing here I want to say. Um, I actually heard a very good Bible-believing Christian pastor, and he takes a lot of good stands. I support them. I support their church. They're, they're good people. And he actually came out and said recently that Christians that celebrate Christmas are actually causing angels to fall from heaven. And I thought to myself, you realize how ridiculous a statement that is? See, what that is, you're lying to try and scare people to do what you want them to do. That's not right to do that. Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That's what Satan is doing right now. What happens there in Revelation chapter 12, that isn't until the future. Okay, So right now, Satan is up there before the throne of God, accusing us Christians day and night. That's what he's doing. And guess what? The angels are standing there listening to the whole thing. And so you got these angels and they're all standing there and Satan comes up and he says, hey, I saw that Christian down there. I saw him looking at pornography. And that Christian over there, I saw them committing adultery. 
And that one over there, I saw them steal money. And that one over there, I saw them cheat on their taxes. And this one over here, I saw this. And that one over there, I saw that. And the devil says, and the angels are standing there going, oh boy, you know, stupid Christians. And all of a sudden the devil says, and I see 10 Christians down there celebrating Christmas. And the angels go, oh, I can't take any more. That's it, I quit. I'm going to join you, Satan. Give me a break. Come on. I mean, you got to be very desperate for a tax on Christmas to use an argument like that. I mean, it's just the height of absurdity. The angels are up there. They're seeing all the wickedness that Christians do. And then, and then because some celebrate Christmas, they quit God and they leave and they go be with the devil. I'm sorry, but that's just a stupid argument. No nice way to put it. Now, what about the vain custom of the Yule tree? That's the actual true term for it. That's where it came from. Should a Christian celebrate customs and holy days? Okay, remember, Mass is the Saxon word for holy day. And some people say, no, you shouldn't celebrate any holidays at all. You know, no holidays. Some say, well, you know, maybe Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of difference of opinion there. But I actually heard uh, Dr. Scott Johnson the one time say that holy days are of pagan witchcraft uh, origin. That the, that the witches came up with this thing of holidays, of holy days. And uh, again, he made a statement there without any kind of understanding of Scripture. Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to see about the thing of holy days. Colossians 2 verse 16 and 17. Okay, it says here, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now I'm going to show you something really interesting here. What's the thing about which are a shadow of things to come? Turn back in your Old Testament to the one of the last books in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 16. Now in this book you have some very interesting prophecies about uh, the coming millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And it's very obvious when you read it that Jesus is physically on the earth. Okay, There is a pre-millennial coming of Jesus Christ. Now what's the thing about a holy day and it says which are a shadow of things to come? Look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. You mean you're going to keep a Jewish holy day in the future? Absolutely. Do we keep the Feast of Tabernacles right now? No. But we will. We eventually will. Verse 17, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So if you don't want to celebrate the holy day there, you're going to actually have no rain You know, in the millennial kingdom. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to, the, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, celebrating a holy day in the millennial kingdom is not going to be optional. There will be no people that say, I won't celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, I don't celebrate holy days, you know. Uh, then you're not going to get any rain in that nation. Very interesting. Now, I want to show you some other interesting things here about this Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. If you look it up, the Feast of Tabernacles occurs in late September. Now, a woman, when she is with child, she is with child for how many months? Nine months. Now, if the Feast of Tabernacles, a lot of the people out there, a lot of scholars and things, a lot of them believe that Jesus was actually born 
at the Feast of Tabernacles. Not December 25th, but probably late September, sometime there in the Feast of Tabernacles. A lot of people kind of have a consensus of that. The shepherds were out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by, by night. They didn't do that in December. It's too cold. They would take their flock in. But in September, they could be out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks. <clears throat> so there's a very good possibility that Jesus was born sometime within the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why in the Millennial Kingdom, he's saying, come up to worship the King at the Feast of Tabernacles. So he would actually want his birth being celebrated. You say, what's this have to do with Christmas? Well, I want you to consider a point here. Okay? When did the Feast of Tabernacles happen? Late September. Okay? How long is a woman with child? Nine months. So if you go Feast of Tabernacles back nine months before that, what do you get? Late December. Possibly, could it possibly have been December 25th when Jesus was conceived? Well, I'm going to be honest. I can't prove that. I can't tell you that Jesus was conceived December 25th. That's the night that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she became with child. I can't prove that. But then, then again, I can't prove it wrong either. And you can't either. We don't have a date when Jesus Christ was conceived. But could it be that Jesus was actually, there's a part of his birth is connected to late December. And I believe that's true. And by the way, just before we continue here, another I was I wrote up the format for this sermon, and then I actually was remembering things afterwards, and so I wrote some notes in here. But another bro, another brother that I read his thing, he said about that the Puritans uh, initially banned Christmas. The early Puritans that came here to America, they would not allow people to celebrate Christmas because they knew it was a pagan holiday. And it's like again, it's a very weak argument. You say, why is it weak? The Puritans killed Christians. The Puritans were known for attacking Anabaptists. Okay? And the, the branches of Anabaptists, you know, they branched off into the Mennonites and the Amish and the, and the Baptists and things. But the point is, the people who baptized by full immersion, those the, the Anabaptist brethren, the re-baptizers, the ones that weren't using baptismal regeneration, the baptizing infants, that stuff, the, the Calvinistic... Puritans were actually putting them to death. And Oliver Cromwell, over there in, in England, he was a Puritan, but he believed in liberty of conscience. And he would not kill Baptists. And there were actually Puritans that were mad at him because he wouldn't go out and execute Baptists. So to use the Puritans and say they didn't celebrate Christmas and, and therefore that was good and holy, uh, that's not a group I want to be associated with a group of tyrannical Christians that are going out killing their enemies. Uh, that's kind of a problem there. Now, what about Jesus? Did Jesus ever celebrate Jewish holy days? Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. You know, the big argument among a lot of the brethren is you're not too... Esteem one day above another. You know, you're just supposed to not have any holy days or any kind of festivals or anything at all. Well, that's a problem. Matthew 26, verse 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, I'll have nothing to do with holy days. They're wrong. They're of pagan origin. Don't have anything to do. Is that what he said? Look at verse 18. And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about Christmas here. I'm talking about a Jewish feast day. But the point is, a lot of these brethren say that any holiday, holy day, or holiday as we call it today, anything like that is wrong. You can see right there, Jesus Christ was celebrating the Jewish Passover. So no, I'm sorry, that doesn't that argument doesn't work. Luke chapter 2. Turn there next. Luke chapter 2, verse 42. Luke 2, verse 42 and 43 is what we're going to read next. And it says here, 
And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So it's interesting there that they were actually going up to Jerusalem for the feast there, just like people will be doing in the Millennial Kingdom. John chapter 5, verse 1. Okay, so you see there, the first one there was Jesus right before he was crucified, keeping the Passover. The second one was Jesus when he was 12 years old. And here's another one, John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So Jesus, as an adult, he was also going to a Jewish feast, traveling to Jerusalem to, have, to celebrate this Jewish feast day, a holy day of the Jews. Now you say, yeah, but okay, this is Jesus, this is before the crucifixion, you know, doctrinally it's in the Old Testament, blah, blah, blah. Okay, did Paul ever celebrate a Jewish holy day? Acts chapter 20. Turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 16. Acts 20, verse 16. It says here, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. You mean Paul would actually cut out some of his missionary journey to celebrate a Jewish feast day? Look at it. That's what it says. Now you say, well, you know, that's because Paul's a Jew. Paul was also a Christian. Does it say anywhere in the Pauline epistles that we are required to keep the Jewish feast days? No. So what was Paul doing? He was keeping the customs of his people. And in fact, right there, he forsook some of the work of the Lord so he could go to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And this isn't Acts chapter 2 Pentecost, by the way. This is another year, years and years later. Let's go on there. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We'll look at verse 6 and through 8. See another time here. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 6. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Again, G Paul keeps a Jewish feast day. He's saying, I'll, I'll stay with you at Ephesus until Pentecost. And then I'm going home. I'm going back to Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people have this notion that Paul totally forsook his family, and he didn't want anything to do with them, and they, they disowned him and all this other stuff. Well, there probably was, they probably were kind of ashamed of him a little bit. Does The Bible doesn't say anything about him having much fellowship with his family. But could it be that he was going back to Jerusalem for these Jewish, Jewish feast days so he could have a, wit, or a, a chance to witness to his family? Well, the Bible doesn't say that, Brian. Yeah, the Bible doesn't say it that it didn't happen that way either. I don't know. Why was he so anxious to go to do something that Jesus Christ never told Christians to do? He was keeping the customs and the tra traditions of his people. See, there's nothing wrong with a Christian celebrating a holiday, a holy day. Now, we're going to sum up here with a couple more verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. Just turn back a little bit there. You say, well, I can't have anything to do with Christmas because it's of pagan origin, you know, heathen origin, and there's some people do evil things associated with it. Well, let's look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 through 9. It says here, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Stop there for just a minute. Do you remember back there in Jeremiah chapter 10 where it said about 
this tree, they're upright as the palm tree, and that there's nothing evil in them, neither is their ability to do good. You're not to be afraid of them. That's what Paul's saying there. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. It's an inanimate object, just like that pistol laying right there on that table. That thing still hasn't shot anybody, has it? No. It's an inanimate object. It's up to the person to make it good or bad. Verse 5. For though there be God, or there the, verse 5, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this Hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Again, you see there, what's sacrifice to idols? It's no really big deal there. It's just meat. Okay? Verse 9, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, Notice there in verse 8 in particular, it says, If we eat, we aren't any better for it, and if we eat not, we aren't any worse. Okay, the, the whole issue there is it's not a major thing. The meat, again, is an inanimate object. Okay, but you have to be careful, of course, not to offend a weaker brother. If you see a, a weaker brother that's into, into Santa Claus, and they're getting into a lot of really heavy partying and stuff, and getting themselves into debt, at Christmas time, well, you need to kind of softly rebuke them about some of that stuff. Tell them not to be so worldly. Ditch the Santa Claus thing. Ditch the thing of having to get, you know, spend thousands of dollars on people. There are aspects of Christmas that should be rebuked. I'm not saying anything that's Christmas or Christmas related is wonderful and good. No. There are some things that you should kind of warn Christians about doing, about partaking in. Okay? But there again, you know, it can actually work on the reverse too. If you're an anti-Christmas Christian and you go to a, a Christian that just got saved or a Christian that Christmas is a very special time and you rebuke them for celebrating Christmas or even a lost person comes to you and they say, Merry Christmas, and you go, that's a pagan wicked thing. What kind of reaction do you think that they're going to give you? You got to be careful about that stuff. Romans chapter 14, we'll go there, and you're going to see here especially this thing of, oh, you can't celebrate Christmas, you, it's just impossible, you're not allowed to do it. Romans chapter 14, these are the two verses, verses 5 and 6, that you can use on any of these anti-Christmas Christians, this is all you really need. But it says here, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. It's up to you. Hey, if you if after listening to this message you don't want anything to do with Christmas, you say, I don't want anything to do with it, I'm I've cut it out of my life, I won't let my kids have anything to do with it. If you're convinced of that, fine. Absolutely fine. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But don't come down on me or on other brethren that choose to celebrate Christmas because it's a time that we can get together with family. It's a time we can enjoy ourselves. Don't you come down on us and condemn us for it. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. All right, now we're going to look at verse 6 here. It says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Again, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Don't condemn me because I decide to celebrate Christmas, and I won't condemn you if you decide not to. Okay? You just say, Brian, I just don't want anything to do with Christmas. I'd rather not. We won't argue about it. Okay, fine. You know, right there, that Glock pistol, somebody says, you know what? I understand, Brian, that that's an inanimate object and it's not a bad thing good or bad whatever I just don't want to have a Glock pistol 
I'm not a gun owner. I don't like guns. Don't want anything to do with it. Fine. That's absolutely fine. I am totally okay with that. But where I get mad is when somebody comes along and they try to say that I am evil because I have a handgun. Then I have a problem. And see, it's the same thing. Somebody comes along and they say, Brian, you know what? I know you celebrate Christmas. That's your issue. That's fine. I won't condemn you for it. Whatever. No problem. No problem at all. But when somebody comes and they say, you're wicked, you're pagan, you're satanic, you're, you're celebrating this wicked thing. Now I got a problem. Okay. Now I got a big problem. Because I'm not doing that. Christmas is a very special time of the year. I have been celebrating it every year since I've been a little boy. It was the most special time in the of, of the year for me. Not because we were pagans and, and sacrificing humans or something at that time of the year. That's ridiculous. And to use those things that some people have done in the past and to, and to tie that then into all of Christmas, that just doesn't work. Okay? It's just a simple thing. Now, I'm going to end here with uh, six questions to the no Christmas brethren. The brethren that say, I don't want anything to do with Christmas. We're going to end with six questions. And I want you to be open-minded and think about these issues. Okay, question number one. What are you going to do with the godly Christmas songs like Joy to the World, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, O come all ye faithful, etc. I won't have anything to do with Christmas. Okay, what are you going to do about the songs? And by the way, on that point, the song that we sung this morning here in our service, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, let me just read you the lyrics real quickly here. And it was written by Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother. And Charles Wesley and, and John Wesley, they had their issues, they weren't perfect, but they were some very fine Christian men, heroes of the faith. Now listen to the lyrics here. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Christ by heaven, highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven-born prince of peace, hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hmm. Well, it's a wicked Christmas song, really? And by the way, at this time of the year, you can go to stores a lot of times and they'll have that song playing. And, all the other ones. and a lot of the other Christian Christmas songs. Hmm. Now, if you say absolutely no Christmas, what are you going to do with those, those hymns? You're going to cut them out of your, your hymn book and never sing them? You're going to condemn them as being wicked pagan songs? So, see, it's a problem. Question number two. Now here's a here's a here's a good one for you. If you are one of these anti Christmas Christians, will you accept or reject a Christmas bonus and paid vacation on December twenty fifth? I'll have nothing to do with Christmas. Okay, then you go into your boss, and when he hands you that extra money, the Christmas bonus, you say, "No, sir, that's a pagan holiday. I'll have nothing to do with it." And by the way, sir. Give me the keys to the place here at work. I'm coming into work on December 25th. And in fact, I do not celebrate any holy days. Therefore, I don't want any paid holy days. Are you going to do that? You wouldn't want to be a hypocrite, would you? It reminds me of a time I used to work at this boat place. And we had a, this black guy from down south. And and uh, I got along with him. We were, you know friendly and everything else we joked around and kidded around you know like you do at a factory 
And but he was Jehovah's Witness. And I remember the one Christmas season, he took the Christmas bonus, of course, and we're sitting out there, and the boss's wife had baked Christmas cookies, and he's just shoveling them down. He's a real big guy. I mean, guy was just as strong as an ox. I mean, he was, you know, strong guy. But anyways, he's shoveling these cookies in his mouth, and, and he's, oh, Christmas is a pagan holiday. I'll have nothing to do with it, blah, blah, blah. Which is strange, too, by the way, Christian. If, you know, if you're against the holidays, you're going to be joining with Jehovah's Witnesses and atheists. Whatever. But he's there rebuking Christmas and everything. And the boss is standing there and he says, uh, you're against Christmas. Oh, yeah, it's wicked. It's horrible. And he said, well, don't have a problem eating the Christmas cookies, though. And you know what he said? He said, yeah, but if you take notice, I didn't eat any with sprinkles on them. Do you think we felt conviction and we wanted to convert to Jehovah's Witnesses by his example? No. And Christian, if you say to the lost world that you don't celebrate Christmas and all this other stuff, they're going to see your hypocrisy when you take your Christmas bonus and when you take time off for Christmas vacation. They'll see right through that. Okay, you're actually going to be doing damage to the cause of Jesus Christ by refusing anything to do with Christmas. Now, next question. When a lost person says Merry Christmas, will you rebuke them? something to think about christmas is evil and pagan and and all this other stuff rebuke a lost person when they say merry christmas to you you know what they're going to think you are they're going to think you're an atheist Fake, yeah. they're not going to say oh well glory to god you know man I, i'm going to get converted now because this guy this christian rebuked me for saying merry christmas <laughs> next question if you ban Christmas because of its heathen origins, are you going to ban everything that is connected to the heathen? You better. I mean, if you're going to start with Christmas, why not go the whole way? Like I was saying earlier. Number five, will you use a computer which was designed by lost pagans and is often used for evil? You know, the very first, some of the very first computers that put out by IBM were used by the Nazis to catalog the prisoners in the concentration camps? And computers eventually are going to be the ones that control the Mark of the Beast system. Are you going to use them? And there's pornography all over the Internet. There's all kinds of wickedness all over the Internet. Are you going to use the Internet? Well, sure, you're going to use it because you can bring glory to God through the computer, through the Internet. That's what this whole ministry is based on. Internet ministry. See, you condemn anything that people can use for evil. It's just absurd. It's ridiculous. Number six. Do you want your children to grow up not understanding a father giving his children gifts? Think about that one. Don't tell your kids, Santa Claus is going to bring you something. I'll condemn that. I'll stand with the anti-Christmas Christians on that issue. Don't teach them Santa Claus. Okay? But teach them that the father, the daddy is working hard and he's going to give mommy and daddy are giving you these nice gifts. See? And then you can use that to springboard and say, it's very similar to God, our Heavenly Father, giving us, first of all, the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. You know? What's it say there in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? You know? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The gift of God. God gives gifts to men. You can read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 there. He gives, not only does he give the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, he also gives gifts, spiritual gifts, for you to minister before him. He'll give you spiritual gifts. Now in closing, let me just say a couple more things here and then we're done. Don't let the Christian Scrooges <laughs> ruin your time of fellowship with your family. Okay, if you're a Christian and you've always celebrated Christmas and it's a time that you get together and enjoy, don't let these Christian Scrooges come out and try to ruin it. Okay, Enjoy the holiday season and use it as an opportunity to celebrate Jesus Christ, which is what most people do. But get rid of Santa Claus. Okay, That's something that you don't want. So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, I just watch out for this stuff that's this, these lies about the Christmas holiday. Christmas does not mean the sacrifice of Christ. 
Okay, it means the festival of Christ or the holy day of Christ, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Not according to my opinions or the opinions of some other. It's according to the, dic the dictionary. All right, that's there. Jeremiah chapter 10 is for the Jews. And you read the context of it, it doesn't even condemn this thing of cutting a tree and, the, and all the decking it with gold and silver. It does not condemn it as a sin. It just says it's a vain custom. All right, there's a lot of vain customs that we have. So their two biggest points that they will use against Christmas, their two biggest points fall apart when you actually look at them. Don't fall for that stuff. All right, make up your own mind. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So that's going to be it for this morning. And one more thing before we go. Let me just say this. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.